up on Car Advice, the dawn of electric democratisation. Hyundai makes a giant leap for mankind with the launch of the Hyundai Ioniq. Beautiful Bavarian, will the stylishly designed BMW X2 crossover lure new car buyers to the German mark for the first time? And a Porsche 911 GT3 Touring and a Nissan GTR Nismo. Which one would you pick if you could only have one? Welcome to Car Advice, I'm Trent Nikolic. Thank you for joining us. Another big week in automotive. We're gonna take a look at the Hyundai Ioniq. This is the first time you've been able to buy a vehicle across a range that comes in plug-in hybrid, conventional hybrid or electric. Big deal for Hyundai and could be a game changer in the electric vehicle states. The BMW X2. Uh, this is a stylish small SUV and it's an important one for BMW because it needs to work for them mm -hmm. and it needs to be what they call a conquest vehicle. So it needs to bring people to the brand from other cars. And lastly, we've got a good desert island dilemma. Not which CD you'd take, which supercar you'd take. <laughs> What's a CD? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who uses them anymore? Which MP3 file you'd take. Um, it's a Porsche 911 GT3 Touring or a Nissan GTR. You've got to pick which one you'd take if you could only have one. Joining me at the desk, Paul Marrick. Hello, mate. Hello. Thank Thank you for being here. Uh, another big week. Let's get straight into it with the news. First up, let's take a look at this news that I think we, we shouldn't be taking it lightly and it would almost be funny if it wasn't so serious mm -hmm. because it just keeps going on. Takata Airbags, recent announcement for New South Wales, which I think is a big deal and it's something that you started asking months ago and Car Advice has gotten on board with about registrations and whether you're allowed to register vehicles that haven't had the airbags replaced. Well, finally, it's actually now illegal. And mm. what will happen is the government will step in and block your car from being re-registered if it's subject to a compulsory recall. So Melinda Pavey, the New South Wales Roads, Roads Minister, came out and said that the RMS may refuse to register a vehicle or may suspend or cancel a vehicle's registration if the vehicle or any part of the vehicle is subject to a compulsory recall. Yep. Now that's excellent news because this doesn't just sit with airbags. Yep. And we know with this Dakota issue, 24 people are dead, 260 injured, and if you have an alpha bag in your car, there is a 50-50 chance it will kill you in a crash. Yeah, the odds are just completely unacceptable. And, and this is not about um, making it difficult for owners of vehicles. It's not about that at all. We understand that you not being able to register your vehicle is problematic, we get that. However, it's just as problematic if you're driving around in what is a 50-50 chance of being a death trap. Well, because as we said, people have died. The other thing as well is you may be fine with it, but mm. what if you've got a passenger in yeah. the car and this thing explodes and yep. kills someone? Mm. They may not have any idea that you're happily accepting that risk. Yep. And for that, you shouldn't have your car registered. I mean, you should have your head checked. If you yeah. don't have this airbag replaced, Get off the road. It's yeah. pretty simple. Yeah, put the car in the garage. Advice at caradvice.com. Let us know if you've tried to have your airbag replaced and had issues with the dealer because we're following a lot of those up at Car Advice. So get in touch if you've had any issues. The seemingly endless variants of the Fiat 500 have continued. Uh, we've had some issues at Car Advice with the pronunciation of this one. Uh, I'm going to help our uh, director Bruce out. It's Spiagina, which means oh, little beach in Italian. Sagan. No, he didn't write that down very well <laughs> in the rundown, so we've had to give him a chop around the ears for that. <laughs> Basically, if you're wondering what this is about, go to Google, type in Fiat 500 Jolly, and you can have a look at what the original concept of this car was about. We love the Fiat 500 in terms no, of its does. retro. Yes, we do. You do. You know you do. You just don't want to admit. It. In terms of retro cars, <laughs> it's actually a very clever little package. 30 of these are coming to Australia and they're going to sell out within about five minutes, I okay. reckon. Look, I agree that it is a retro package yeah. and certainly more original than something like a Mini, which Correct. is now a the size of a you know, football field. That's right. Um, we're talking about a car, 25990 before mm. on-road costs. Not we'll expensive. get a manual, we'll get an auto. Yeah. Um, I, I get what the original Jolly looked like, but this looks nothing like it. This just looks like a Fiat 500. It's got cool steel-looking wheels, little hubcap, sardine roof. You know, it's good. I don't know that I could realistically pay like yeah. thirty thousand. Couldn't drive for that. it. No. I reckon it'll sell out in ten minutes. Let us know. Advice at caradvice.com. Paul's wrong. It's actually a good little car, the Fiat 500. Whether you like this variant or not is another story. But let us know. Advice at caradvice.com if you'd buy one. In an announcement that could be either surprising or completely unsurprising, depending which side of the political debate you follow, the Ford plant in Geelong will be used to build wind turbines. Now, 
I know we're, you know, seeing more and more of these around, but this is a big deal, isn't it? Changing a, you know, a former car manufacturing facility to build wind turbines. Yeah, look, it's good news. Um, I knew a lot of people that worked at Ford yeah. in Geelong yeah. that were displaced by this, so it's good that they're reusing the site. But it is kind of glitter on this <laughs> lining here because they're employing 20 staff in a $3.5 million factory where they're going to, to create four megawatt uh, drivetrains mm. and hubs for these wind turbines. Yep. And it's a pretty impressive setup because Vestas, the, the Danish company that's building these, says that they will have enough of these once they're done to produce enough energy to power Geelong, Warrnambool and Ballarat. So they're going to be about 600,000 wind turbines then because they're not the most efficient generator of electricity, well, are mean, they? Wind is free, yeah, so true, that's it's true. better than not yeah. electricity. Yeah. But uh, it's an interesting move because the, the 20 people they're employing is not really going to offset the, the hundreds yeah, that I, were I, I find that hard to believe that you'd only be employing 20. You'd, you'd think off the top of the, you know, or just off the top of your head, there'd be a lot yeah. more than 20 people employed because these are huge things they're building. So, yeah. yeah, 20 jobs, not that great when you're talking about thousands that lost their job. Yeah, exactly. And Get to hear what Ford's doing with their plant in Broadmeadows mm. uh, because the Broadmeadows site is actually quite an opportunistic area it because is. it's in a huge growth corridor mm. that could turn it into shopping centres. There's mm. a whole bunch of really good things that can happen there. So it's good to see them reusing the Geelong site, but I'll be keen to see how this plays out. Uh, mm. Where will these go once they're built? How's it all going to work? Will there be prospects for more people to be employed? Mm. We'll be watching this one pretty closely. I've got an idea for Ford what they could do with Broadmeadows is what we said Holden could have done with their yep. facility. Why don't they start importing F trucks and converting them to right-hand drive in low volume, start with the F-150 Raptor, that'd be really good, and then you could keep a whole bunch of people in jobs. Advice at caradvice.com. If you're a local in Victoria down there near Broadmeadow, let us know what you think they should do with that very historic site. Now, if you were questioning which manufacturer globally might be a leader in electric vehicle technology, you probably might not think Hyundai straight off the bat, Paul. I reckon that'd be fair to say. Yeah, absolutely. However, there's a range of cars that Hyundai's released recently that I'm particularly excited about, and there's good reason for it. The Hyundai Ioniq is their new future vehicle platform, and it's the first time one manufacturer has covered the bases of plug-in hybrid, conventional hybrid, and fully electric. And we've recently done a range review on this vehicle and I think it's exciting. Can you just first explain a little bit about the differences between those three platforms? Okay, so we know first up that Hyundai does a range of things in Australia, including this stuff, they're doing hydrogen as yeah. well. So it's remarkable to think the Koreans have come out of nowhere here mm -hmm. to kind of dominate this segment. Yeah. The Ionic range is fascinating because initially Hyundai was saying that they would only bring in the full electric or just the hybrid, but they've gone the whole hog here and delivered everything starting from $33,990. Now, that is cheap. It's affordable, isn't it? That is really cheap. Yep. So that comes with the five-year warranty and all the all the bells and whistles you expect from Hyundai. When you then step up to the plug-in hybrid, you're talking about forty thousand nine hundred and ninety plus on-road costs. But the thing that has most people excited is the full electric. Yeah. Forty-four thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars. Now, the reason that's so exciting is because up until now, you've had to buy it. A Tesla, mm. effectively. Yeah. I mean, everything else on the market has been pretty expensive. The Renault Zoe is about the $50,000 mark. So this is a full suite of cars yeah. at a reasonable price. And you touched on it initially there, but um, Hyundai also does hydrogen and diesel. So they do yeah. conventional, petrol, then hydrogen, then diesel, plus these three variants here. The difference between these is pretty simple, really. The plug-in hybrid, you plug it in, you charge it, it's got X amount of range, and then it's also got a conventional petrol engine. The hybrid does dance between the two, which we understand from Toyota and Lexus. Yep. So it can uh, it can go between the two engines and you don't ever plug it in. And then pure electric is pure electric. The point that you made there, I think, is really worth mentioning again. First of all, Hyundai has not hedged their bets. They've said, let's bring all three yep. variants of this car to Australia. So that's fantastic because if one suits you more than the other, um, you can go down that road. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is the pricing. Um, for me, the price of that electric vehicle is compelling. It doesn't have a 400 kilometre range like some of the other vehicles do. It's 250, 260 kilometres. However, for most people, that's more than enough. And if it's affordable, that's a big deal as well. Yeah, and even though the electric one seems to make a lot of sense here, it's the plug-in hybrid that I think will win over a lot of buyers. Yeah. You've got a range of 63 kilometres and it runs through its own internal battery system. So you plug it in like a conventional electric car but mm. then it also has a petrol engine as well to give you that range extension. Mm. We had that car in the Melbourne office recently and 
I was able to go to and from home uh, several times with that range. Mm. And most people are travelling around 30 kilometres a day maximum to and from work. So this concept really works well there. It uses an onboard 8.9 kilowatt hour battery system. But when you step up to that full electric with 280 kilometres range, it has a 6.6 .6 kilowatt onboard charger. Yep. But then you can also charge it at 100 kilowatts through rapid charging through the combined CCS port. Yep. So it is Feature packed. It has everything that you need there to get you started in an EV. And then they'll also sell you a home charger as yep. well. So you can charge it overnight as well at home, which is pretty cool. Well, we've got the Tesla version of the home charger at our office in Sydney and we plugged the Hyundai in yep. because it runs off a similar plug. And it was taking less than two hours to charge yep. it from about 20% to back up to full. So that's really impressive as well. Now, going back to the plug-in hybrid, there's been some conjecture even amongst um, us at the Car Advice office about whether plug-in hybrids kind of like this strange bridging yep. technology between the two. Now, I get that, and I get that for some people it doesn't make a lot of sense. However, the point that you made there, I think we should mention again as well. Most people have less than a 30 kilometre commute. So mine door to door is about 20 kilometres yep. from home to the office. So if I had that plug-in hybrid, I could charge it overnight at home, I could drive to work, yep. and I could drive home and use no petrol, yep. plug it in again, and for Monday to Friday for my commute, I'm effectively doing it without ever having to go to a petrol station. Yep. And I think for a lot of buyers, as you said, that'll make sense, it's easy to understand, and they can get their head around how the technology works. Exactly, but the, the best thing here, if you you know, put the technology to one side, it's driving these cars. So Hyundai yep. does the ride and handling tuning for these in Australia. And that electric car has some absolute mumbo. You yeah, get it does. On it, it yeah. gets up nicely. Plug-in hybrid's good to drive as well. They're roomy inside. They're really well built. You don't actually feel like, you, you know, when you, you're getting into some of these older mm. electric cars like the Mitsubishi i mm. where it looked like a science experiment. Yeah, it just, just looks rubbish. stupid, yeah. Um, this is just like a normal mm. car. You can drive it. Yeah. Nobody thinks that you're trying to save the planet. In fact, on, on that note, the only criticism we really had of it is that it doesn't quite look funky enough. A lot yep. of people would prefer it looked a little bit edgier or a little like bit a more futuristic like yep. a Prius. I'm happier that it doesn't. I like the fact that it kind of looks like an Elantra or yep. it kind of looks like any other Hyundai with a hatch. Yep. Um, it doesn't look too silly. You're not going to stand out too much on the road. The point you made there about driving them too, very relevant. I jumped in and out of all three of them over the course of the week. Uh, for me, I'd have to say, if I had the home charger set up, I think I'd go pure electric. Yep. Because for me, it'd be a run around A to B around town. I'm not going to be doing more than 250 Ks in a hit normally on Monday yep. to Friday. Um, you know, we might do more than that when we're testing, but generally to run around, that's more than enough. For me, I think I'd probably go pure electric because I really enjoyed driving it. And I, I do like the feel of an electric vehicle. I've really come to appreciate how they work technologically. But I still think that point you made about the, the plug-in hybrid, that's probably the one that more punters are going to go yep. for because also it's not quite as expensive. Well, here's a question for you. Toyota has access to the Prius Prime yep. overseas, which is their version of the plug-in mm. hybrid of the Prius. They've never once really entertained bringing it Why here. is it not here? I don't know. Do you yeah. reckon this will be enough to get them across the line? Because we just need everyone to have an opportunity mm. here to buy whatever they want. Yeah. And then well, that's what Hyundai's it. done that I think deserves real support. They've, mm. they've brought all three of them. You can choose yeah. which one. And I think you're right. I think if this Hyundai sells really well, Toyota would be mad not to be looking at the business case yeah. thinking we need to get in on that, especially if the plug-in hybrid works really well uh, sales-wise. So you might find government fleets and company cars looking at the electric where they do a back-to-base system. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think for private buyers, either the hybrid or the plug-in, and I'd love to see Toyota get on board. I think it'd be great. Well, if this thing doesn't suit you, they're also bringing out the Kona EV. Mm, so the Kona right. is obviously the small SUV. Mm. That will be full electric as well. Uh, pricing is still to be confirmed on that. But I'm also looking forward to that because if if, if the idea of a hatch doesn't really appeal yeah. to you, the SUV thing, which people love at the moment, uh, mm. will really sort of tick that yeah, box. Yeah, you as can't well. go wrong. Go to caradvice.com and have a look at this range review. Have a really close look at all the numbers, all the facts and figures, and let mm. us know here, advice at caradvice.com, which of the three best suits you. <laughs> SUVs. Yeah. Uh, people in Australia tend to like them, don't they? Even not real SUVs. Not real <laughs> SUVs, yeah. So the BMW X2. Uh, which we've spoken about on the show before. We've test-driven one here. I don't quite know where the X2 fits in, to be completely honest Let with me you. help you. Oh, Trent. okay, good. So according to BMW, 60 to 65% <clears throat> of the people that will come to buy the X2 are first-time BMW customers. Right. So they're obviously targeting someone who 
didn't know they needed an SUV until they saw it at a BMW dealership. <laughs> and it's priced accordingly. I mean, this car here that we're testing, 55900 bucks starting mm. price. Yep. The whole range starts from just under $50,000 plus on-road costs. So it is expensive. Mm. It shares a platform with the X1. We've discussed in previous episodes that the X1 has then shared with other cars mm. in the BMW slash mm. mini world as yeah. well. So... It's really an interesting car and I don't really understand it myself. Now you just touched on their first time buyers. Rob Margate reviewed this out of yeah. our Sydney office and I love the way he started the story. He said, hands up if you know the top 10 reasons that people buy certain cars in order. All the boring stuff, safety, fuel consumption, price, ride and yep. handling, all of that stuff, way down the order. In other words, completely irrelevant. Yep, of course. Leading the charge for buyers is perceived reliability, which makes yes. sense. A lot of the questions we get here in the advice section are, if I buy this car, will it be reliable? Yep. Will it cost me an arm and a leg to keep on the road? However, number two in the list of why you buy a car, styling. Yes. Now in Australia, yeah. we're car fans, we love cars, we don't just buy them to get from A to B. Yep. We've discussed this many times before, that even people who don't like cars have an opinion on which one they like the look of or the style of or why yep. they'd buy one over a certain vehicle. So I think that's what BMW's done here. Now, even I'm not the biggest fan of SUVs in general and sometimes I think the styling can look a bit, little bit clumsy. That actually looks really good. I think yes. the style of that is pretty good. And have you noticed this? Up in that back corner there yep. on the ABC pillar, mm. there's a BMW badge. Yeah. So they're now putting badges <laughs> on the front, on the back, yeah. on the wheels, on the side. On the side. <laughs> Just so you don't forget it's a BMW. We should count how many badges they've used. Oh, I reckon they've yeah. used a whole stack of them. Uh, but let's talk about the engine specifically with this car. So the 20i is a step up from the 18, which mm. is where it starts at the entry yeah. level. So it's a four-cylinder engine, 141 kilowatts of power, 280 newton metres of torque. It's pretty leisurely, 0 mm. to 107.7 .7 seconds. Yeah. But they're doing something here that I... I detest a little bit, and that's dual clutch gearbox. So yeah. it uses a seven speed. Yeah. They do this primarily for fuel efficiency because yeah. it does improve performance, but generally only on sports cars. So you see an eight to 10% saving on mm. fuel efficiency, which kind of makes sense. The good thing here when we talk about running costs though, is you can get a prepaid service plan yeah. with BMW that pays for five years of servicing. Depending on the car, it's circa around sort of thirteen to fifteen hundred bucks. That is excellent value. It's great for money. value for money, and you'd be silly not to do that when you oh, buy yeah. the car at the outset, because then for the next however many years, Absolutely. five years in this yeah. case, you don't have to fork out every time you got to get it serviced. I think just on the S Drive eighteen i there, that comes in. It's front wheel drive, petrol powered only. It comes yeah. in at just under fifty thousand dollars. So BMW's been pretty aggressive here in chasing an affordable end of the market. Uh, and offering yep. this platform under $50,000. You touched on the DCT there, and much like the CVT, so dual clutch transmission, constantly variable transmission, um, the DCT is better, in, I think, in high performance applications. Absolutely. It's good on racetrack, it's good in really high yeah, launch power, control. Yeah, yep. high powered performance cars makes a lot of sense. Can get a little jerky around town. The CVT um, feels a little strange, and we often say that if you love driving, you're not going to like CVT yep. transmissions. I think philosophically this is an interesting move by BMW because they've always had a tendency to say, aside from performance cars like M3 or M4, yep. we think um, that a conventional automatic is a better option for day-to-day exactly. -day driving. So to move in a segment where you've got first-time buyers, a lot of middle-of-the-road customers yep. who are buying SUVs, yep. which is where the volume is, to go with a DCT. Mm, it is fascinating stuff. And the, the other curious emissions here as well, three-year warranty, and BMW yep. isn't the only one guilty of this. Yep. Three-year warranty, I mean, seriously, everyone, almost everyone mm. in the top 10 outside of Nissan is now offering a five-year warranty. That's right. And yeah. then we have guys like Mercedes-Benz, Audi, BMW still stuck in the Stone Ages mm. with a three-year warranty. Why do you get less for spending more? That's it right. That makes yeah. sense. Um, Apple CarPlay, optional, <laughs> and it's a subscription. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these guys are really milking it for you're all getting it. You're getting it in a 20-something thousand dollar criminal. clear as standard, aren't you? It is criminal stuff. Look, I've got no problem at all admitting that I would buy a car based on style. For me, oh, the way a car yeah. looks, the way a vehicle looks has always been Anything a big deal. Anything that'll help you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> need as much help as I can get. Let us know, advice at caradvice.com, if you're willing to admit that style is an important <laughs> reason that you buy a car. But also, if you don't own a BMW and you've never owned a BMW, let us know whether this X2 would bring you to the brand because that's what they'd like to find out. I love this question, mate. Kez recently had a story on the website, 911 GT3 Touring yep. and Nissan Nismo GTR, what we call a faux comparison. So not a real hardcore straight out comparison, yep. but we've had a good reader question about it. Okay, so this one is from 
Tomas, mm. with a Z, with a Z uh, yeah. in Sydney, saying that they can't believe <laughs> we actually put the GT3 Touring in the same breath yeah. as a GTR Nismo. Mm. Discuss. It's a <laughs> yeah, thanks, Thomas. <laughs> um, look, it's, it's a fair question, and I'll put my hand up here and say, as you know, I'm no 911 fanboy. Right, I'm. I'm just not. Never have no, been. You like the Fiat 500. I do like all. the Fiat 500, and I'm. I'm chief amongst those saying that 911 designers are the laziest in the world, yep. in that it's never changed. However, I've just spent a week in the GT3 touring this exact car. Yep. There is no contest for me. You buy the 911, you don't even worry about yep. the Nissan. Now I know the GTR is an icon, but it's an old platform now. I really don't think it's actually aged that well. It's a big, heavy yep. vehicle, and. You know, you can see there, it looks like a bigger, heavier vehicle just to look at, and it feels like a big, heavy vehicle to drive. Well, And I can tell you that it's not easy. It's a handful on a racetrack. Here's the irony. Yeah. The bigger, heavier vehicle is yeah. actually quicker. Yeah, so that's right. That's the thing that confuses me yeah. here. We've got two cars that, um, I mean, they are both absolute weapons. They the are. problem here, though, with the GT3 Touring is that it only comes in manual. That's right. The GTR has a dual-clutch gearbox, which it means it'll do 0 to 100 in 2.7 seconds. And all-wheel drive versus rear-wheel drive, And all-wheel drive, whereas yeah. the, the Porsche will... I mean, it's, it's going to take a lot longer yeah. than that. Mm. So this is the biggest issue here. If you do want an all-out, you know, ball-tearing sports car here, the Nismo is clearly the car because... Mm. On a track, yeah. I think the GT3 would have a hard time keeping up with it. It is a ballistic twin mm. turbo V6. Mm. But I'm <laughs> I'm with Tabaz here that I don't know. I mm. just that's three hundred thousand dollars for the Nismo. Mm. The Porsche is about twenty thousand dollars more. Mm. I reckon three hundred grand is about a hundred grand too much. Well, we know that the Nismo, well, we know that the GTR has been dropping like a stone in yeah. value secondhand anyway, and the Porsche GT3 tends to hold its value quite nicely. The other thing philosophically that's different as well, not just rear wheel drive and all wheel drive, is that the Porsche is naturally aspirated. Yeah. Uh, you know, red lines up near 9,000 RPM, the thing absolutely screams. You get it to 6,000 RPM and it's like it's got a turbo strap to it, it goes crazy <laughs> above that. Uh, you know, manual only means A, you have to enjoy driving a manual, yeah. and like you said, on a racetrack, no matter how good you are, you're going to be slower than an equivalent automatic. Yep. So, you know, there are philosophical differences here. But the one point I will say too, is don't buy the Nissan and think that it's going to be cheaper to run than the Porsche because the servicing costs, I think, yeah. will be right up there. Exactly. And the other, th just very quickly, the other keen thing I noticed as well, mm. when Porsche celebrated the 50th anniversary of the 911, uh, there was a publication, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they did 50 sets of launch control mm. in the 911, one after the other. Yeah. And it didn't break. Yeah, and no the problem. best bit was the fastest 0 to 100 patch was somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So it only got quicker as it went. Mm. Try doing that in the Nissan, and I reckon <laughs> you get three or four out of it before it just stops working. <laughs> it goes to sleep. Let us know which one you'd buy. Advice at caradvice.com. SUVs, dual cab utes and towing. The hits keep coming in the advice section and we've got another one here, mate. This is a good one. I tow a horse float once a month yep. and my friend suggested the Ford Ranger Wildtrak. Well, that's not a bad start at all. I've looked at the Mercedes-Benz X250D, so that's the X-Class Ute, and I'm thinking of buying it because we have a Mercedes C200 family car. Oh, yeah. Here's the kicker. Is it worth sticking with one brand when buying multiple vehicles? Mm -hmm. So first off, yes, that's not a bad idea. I think if the vehicle suits what you want to do yeah. and you stick within one you brand... good service from them. Exactly. Yeah. You get good service. You're back there twice as often because you've got two cars. You know the service manager probably looks after you. So that in theory, is a good idea, yeah. if the choice of vehicle works. Now, I'm not sure that a four-cylinder X-Class is the right way to go if you're towing a horse float. Well, unless they're Shetland ponies. <laughs> yeah, that's In right. which case, you could possibly yeah. get away with it. Yeah, miniature um, horses. Now, the reason we say that is because the X-Class is virtually a Nissan Navara. Correct. The only difference is that it weighs a lot more. Mm. So you've got the same engine with the same torque output, but yeah. you're asking it to tow a lot more before you even hook a trailer up. Yeah, you're paying a penalty to start with. Yeah, so when you compare the two, it's the Ranger that you'd prefer to tow with. It's a nicer car overall, it rides better, it's it's really well equipped and a, and a nice car to drive. And 3.2 litre five cylinder engine up against a two and a half yeah. litre four cylinder. It's a bit of a no brainer, but yeah. If you are towing a lot more, this is really where a V6 is going to come in handy yeah. and it may be worth if you want to stick within the Mercedes-Benz family looking at the X-Class V6. They are expensive though, mm. $70-ish thousand dollar starting price. So that's 350D against 250D, yeah. but again, it's going to be up around 90 grand on the road, isn't it, once you put a that's few a options into it? You know what else is about 90 grand? Mm. The Ram 1500. Yeah, that's going to tow It's a car nicely. that we like. Yeah, it's we love it. It's got a big Hemi V8, yeah. but 
even with that Hemi V8, it really performs well when it's towing. Mm. Um, the other one that, if you want to save a bit of money, the Volkswagen Amarok V6 kicks off in core edition under $50,000. Yep. That is a really good engine for towing, especially if you are loading a couple of horses in. So just looking at a couple of things there, I think the safety aspect of the Amarok is not an issue if yep. you're not using the second row as much and it's purely or primarily because as a tow no vehicle. Airbags there. That's right, yep. exactly, no safety uh, in the second row. Now, the point you made there before about four-cylinder, five-cylinder and V6 engines is really relevant here because just because a dual cab ute is rated to tow something doesn't mean it can actually do it easily. We've put two and a half tons exactly. behind the Navara that we own at Car Advice and it didn't really want to know yeah. about it on the highway and that's a ton under what it's rated to tow. Exactly. So imagine if you're going up closer to that three ton mark. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas we put the same weight behind something like the 70 series we own, didn't even know it was there. So Paul's advice there is good. I'd absolutely have a look at the V6 yep. and throw the RAM in. Uh, keep those questions coming, advice at caradvice.com. We love getting them and we love coming up with some good answers for you. Paul, thanks for joining thanks, us. Thanks, mate. Uh, once again, we've run out of time, as we always do. Until then, see you next week, same time, 7.30 p.m., Wednesday nights on Your Money.